So good evening, everyone, and welcome to the third session of uh, of this course. And today we have with us uh, Dr. Ravi Koparapu, who will be presenting. Uh, you know, who will be talking about exoplanets, uh, its history, and all all the interesting stuff that he's going to talk about. Uh, so just uh, before we start, uh, participants are messaging in the uh, in the chat box that whether we will get PPTs, whether we will get videos. So as I've mentioned earlier also that, you know, we will take constant from the respective speakers and then we will be able to share the videos and uh, presentations with you. We will be surely uh, giving uh, reading material, etc. to you, but that is at the end of the session, after the end of the course. Okay, so please uh, make uh, make a note of all of this. Over to you, Dr. Ravi. Thank you, Prachi. Let me share my screen. Uh, and uh, first, let me thank everyone for coming over. Uh, I want to first, let me share the screen if I see desktop one. Just give me a second. Uh, yeah. Yes, it's okay. Oh, all right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so this uh, part of the lecture would be on exoplanets. Uh, those are the worlds beyond our solar system. In the earlier two lectures, you've heard about the stars and the stellar structure and evolution from Dr. Kambabi. Um, I'm going to give a very brief introduction to the discovery of exoplanets, the history, uh, a very brief history of the exoplanets how they were discovered and what we were expecting and what did we found. And uh, uh, going through the lectures, we will see about the detection techniques that were used and why we are finding the kind of planets we are finding right now. And I'd also have some fun problems for us to deal with, uh, you know, for you all to work out. And I leave some a uh, lot of time for uh, Q and A's uh, in the, at the end of this lecture. Uh, I just have to, to begin with, I'll say that we are now living in the golden era of exoplanets. Uh, this is where science fiction meets science. Uh, we've, uh, we've always thought about uh, humanity uh, for the last many thousands of years, have already thought about where we could, uh, there are planets out there and if there could be life outside our solar system, outside of the earth. And I'm going to say this very clearly that within your lifetime, you will know if there are if there is any alien life or not on these planets. So we are that close to finding out uh, one of the most fundamental questions uh, that we have asked forever. Um, so I'll begin with uh, our habitable planet. Uh, so far, Earth is the only habitable and inhabited planet in our solar system. There is a difference. Uh, a planet can be habitable and but need not be inhabited. Inhabited means it could be there is life on the planet. Habitable means that there are all sorts of right conditions for the planet to have life, but it may not have life on it. Uh, so when we say habitable planet, it may have right kind of atmosphere, right kind of water, uh, water on the surface of the planet or interior to the planet. Uh, th those are the right conditions for a habitable planet. And uh, so far, we know one inhabited planet in the entire universe, which is Earth, confirmed evidence. If you are disputing that, maybe then we should talk. So our solar system, here is a picture of our solar system here. Um, you can see uh, a nice arrangement of planets over here. The first four planets, as you all know, I've seen since grade school. Uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, those are called terrestrial planets or rocky planets because they have uh, dense uh, uh, cores and uh, uh, very thin atmospheres compared to the size of the planets. And then we have gas giants uh, beyond uh, the first four planets. Those gas giants are Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. We no longer call Pluto as a planet. Pluto is still there. We just don't call it as a planet. Uh, for various reasons. We will discuss that in the Q&A if you want to. Uh, so this is this has been the model of a planetary system for many, many thousands of years for us. Uh, our our, our uh, theories and mythologies and uh, stories uh, and science was based on this kind of arrangement of planets uh, and the kind of planets we see in our solar system, right? 
I mean, this is the only system we know. This is the only kind of a house, if you say, we will know. Uh, we, we have been, uh, uh, you know, thinking about. And uh, there were searches uh, later on and for planets outside the solar system. And this is where the begin, this is the beginnings of uh, where, how the exoplanets were discovered. Um, for uh, centuries, people suspected there were exoplanets. For decades, scientists searched for exoplanets. When I say extra exoplanets, there are extrasolar planets, they are the same. They are planets orbiting stars other than the sun, out, uh, other stars. And our solar system seemed like a nice model for other systems too, right? I just showed you the solar system one. So we expected that, okay, uh, if our solar system had Jupiter-sized planets, uh, you know, in this kind of an arrangement, uh, yeah, maybe we will find similar solar systems or similar star systems uh, with uh, if we start looking for them. Uh, if you remember, Jupiter in our solar system has an orbital period of 12 years. So it takes 12 years for Jupiter to go around the sun. Whereas for Earth, obviously it takes, you all know, it's one year. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and for Venus and you know Mars and Mercury, Mercury takes only about uh, roughly 90 days or 88 days to go around the sun. And Venus about 270 or 220, uh, 220 days or so. Um, so we, for uh, Jupiter, which is the largest planet in our solar system, it takes 12 years to go around it. So we were, uh, we were thinking to see if we can find a Jupiter-sized planet around a sun-like star. You might ask, why are we looking for Jupiter-like planets? Why not directly look for Earth-like planets, Earth-sized planets? Uh, why should we care about Jupiter? We will come to that in a minute. Uh, and you will see why we were actually looking for Jupiter's first, and then we started looking for Earth-sized planets. So anyway, so we we were we were looking for Jupiter-sized planets in a twelve-year orbit around Sun-like stars. And uh, remember, to find this kind of a planet, you need to wait twelve years to get a one full orbit in your data. When you are collecting the data uh, from the star and the planet, you need to get data points right every time you are pointing your telescope. And so to get a full orbit, you need to wait 12 years. So obviously this is a long, it requires a long time and it did take long time. Uh, and so we collected, we waited for decades and decades, for centuries, um, for, a, for a century or so to find a Jupiter-like planet in a 12 year orbit. So we had, you know, multiple 12 years of our data collected and uh, we haven't seen any in the beginning. So our biggest planet is 12 years around the sun. So why not look for Jupiter-sized planets in a 12-year orbit around the sun like stars, right? Okay, great, that's good. Um, so the universe had a different idea, right? So universe is very clever. It, universe has no need or no expectation from, from us and it doesn't care about our expectations. It gives what it gives and it is our need, our need to find what the universe is uh, uh, giving us, right? So what happened was the first extrasolar planet was actually detected around a pulsar, a neutron star, a dead star, a rotating neutron star. Uh, you may have uh, uh, learned about this in Dr. Kemavi's lecture yesterday, uh, what, what a pulsar was. Uh, it's, a, it's a dead neutron star, uh, pulsating neutron star, rotating neutron star that's pulsing out uh, radiation. And uh, Alex Wilson from my alma mater, Penn State, uh, see, he uh, was the one who first found uh, the first ex confirmed extrasol extrasolar planets around another star, any other star, not just like the sun, but around any kind of star. Um, and he was not even looking for these planets. And he was... Um, he, he's a radio astronomer. And so he's doing some radio astronomy uh, observations of pulsars uh, as uh, that was his work, that was his job. And then he found out that uh, pulsars are really very, very good uh, timing um, uh, objects, extremely precise. So you get pulsars at very, very regular in intervals. He noticed in his data that some of the sometimes these regular intervals are not coming at those uh, specified uh, times, and when you know he removed all kinds of you know defects that he could think about, it still showed some kind of irregularity in the pulses coming out from the pulsar. 
And there was only one kind of a explanation at that time that you know there must be something orbiting the star that is uh, moving the pulsar in such a way that the pulses are not coming in regular intervals. Uh, and when he and his team estimated uh, what those objects were and find figured out the masses of those objects, they you know they found extrasolar planet, three exoplanets found, uh, and one of them was actually moon mass the mass of our moon, kind of a moon mass. And so this was a stunning result. How can planets form around a neutron star, a pulsating neutron star? Because as you all probably uh, heard about this uh, in Dr. Kemmerich's lecture, a neutron star forms after a supernova explosion, right? And so, which means that once a star explodes, it may have taken away, blown up the planets around it as well. So how come these planets formed? So I'll let you all think about it, and we can talk about this in the Q and A uh, at the end of the lecture. And so, but there are planets. So they found planets, even though star exploded and the neutron star formed. <clears throat> so this was a very stunning result back in 1992. And now we know that there could be planets outside our solar system, like real planets outside our solar system, even though it's around a dead star. Three years later, in 1995, uh, more observations of sun-like stars uh, when they performed those kind of observations. The first exoplanet was discovered, and it's the star uh, is called 51 Pegasus, and the planet is called the 51 Pegasi B. Um, so that was good. So we were looking for planets around sun-like stars. So we found a planet around a sun-like star. Fantastic. It was Jupiter-sized planet. All right. And uh, that's even better, right? That's what we were looking for, a Jupiter-sized planet around a sun-like star. Great, fantastic, everybody congratulated. I thought they, they did the right thing. So we were expecting this kind of arrangement, a Jupiter-sized planet in a 12-year orbit around a sun-like star, great. But we found this. The 51 Pegasi B orbit around its sun is four days. It's less than a week. So. Uh, it takes less than you know week for this planet to go around the star. Imagine how hot it would be and how um, uh, you know uh, unbearable it would be uh, among, in terms of how much energy the planet would be receiving from the sun. So this was obviously again. I, I keep saying this in the in my talk all the time. Universe does not care about our expectations. It it gives what it gives. Why did we find this? We were expecting 12 years, and why did we find a four-day orbit one? You will see this in our in the next couple of slides when we talk about how we are finding these uh, planets. <clears throat> oh yeah, and so because of this discovery, the 2019 Physics Nobel Prize was awarded to uh, Dieter Kello and Michel Mayer um, uh, for the discovery of the first exoplanet around the sun-like star. Okay, so now we will talk about the radial velocity detection technique. It's one of the detection techniques uh, that was used to discover these planets, uh, one of the popular uh, detection techniques. Um, this, uh, you know, this comes from something called a Doppler velocity or Doppler effect. You probably heard about this in your classes, uh, either from the, uh, when you're uh, studying about uh, sound waves or even uh, about light waves. Uh, it's essentially the uh, radial uh, the Doppler effect is when you see the increase in frequency when an object, the source of the emission uh, of that uh, radiation is coming towards you. It increases in frequency. You will hear a higher pitch. And as it recedes, as it further goes away, you will see a lower frequency and you know uh, you will see a lower pitch. Uh, so a similar technique is used here for radial velocity technique, which is as the planet and the star are orbiting each other around the center of mass, right? So the planet doesn't orbit and the, you know, they, they orbit actually a center of mass. What you see when you are take, when you're look, when you're pointing the telescope towards a star is the star light. The planet light you will see in, in few other slides is pretty small. And so you take the light coming from the star, you split it into a spectrum, and then you see the spectrum and you see that the spectrum is wobbling. And why is it wobbling? There must be something that's making the star move. The light is coming from the star. So the star must be moving, hence the spectrum is moving. And so when you see that the spectrum is moving, you know its period, how much it's moving. So you will know how, what is the orbital period of that object uh, that's making the star go back and forth. So you will know the orbital period. 
<coughs> you can find uh, something else, uh, which we will come the mass. And here is an explanation of how the radial velocity technique, uh, why, why do we call it a radial velocity and what kind of a method we would be using. Here is a person, an observer on the left-hand side. You have a line of sight, right? If the system is inclined towards you by some inclination angle of I or something, which you can see here, the inclination angle I at the center of mass, radial velocity is the radial component of the velocity of the, uh, of the planet that's going. Radial component is going away from you, right? Or towards you, not the tangential one. So if you have, a, if the planet is going uh, in, in its orbit, you can split the velocity of the velocity vector into two components, the radial uh, component and the angular component, uh, and the perpendicular component here. And the radial velocity is the radial uh, component that you see along the line of sight. And you can, you can see that it's basic geometry that the radial velocity is, act, is given by the actual velocity of the planet times the sine of the angle, inclination angle. So here is where it becomes really important. If the inclination angle is 90 degrees, uh, essentially it's perpendicular, you know, you're, you're looking uh, along the plane, uh, which the radial velocity uh, essentially becomes the actual velocity of the planet. So the observed velocity is the velocity of the planet, which is when you will uh, you will see uh, quite a you know much bigger wobble of the star. Here is an animation that shows what happens if the inclination is along the line of sight, along your um, uh, eye, eye line of sight. Uh, what you see is at the bottom left, and uh, that's the that's how what uh, you will not see the blue planet going around the star. What you will see is the spectrum on the right hand side. Like I said, you take the starlight and you split it into a spectrum, right? You see that starlight spectrum is moving with respect to a standard spectrum. And it's because it's a periodic motion, you see this curve, a sinusoidal curve. And that sinusoidal curve has a period and an amplitude, which means you will also get how big the, uh, the amplitude of the, uh, of the motion is. Uh, so this is when the planet is inclined right at the uh, line of sight. Uh, there are other ways, uh, uh, you know, if the planet is, if the system is inclined per, uh, perpendicular to your line of sight. So essentially you are looking, the planet is going in this plane. So in this plane, and you're looking through perpendicular to it, you won't see any radial component. There is no radial velocity coming towards you, the radial component of the velocity. And so you won't see the starlight moving. You won't see the spectrum moving. You will just see a standard steady still spectrum. And because of that, you uh, because we won't know the inclination. Here, I'm just giving you an example of what happens at 90 degree inclination angle, and what happens if it's uh, face on. It's called a face on zero degree inclination angle. Um, but uh, you know, we will never know with the radial velocity technique what is the inclination angle of of the system. It will always be some sort of an inclination. And if you do the math right, uh, you, we will come to that in a minute. You will see that we can only get the minimum mass of the planet because we do not know the inclination. The radial component makes it in such a way that we will know the minimum mass. So what does, this, what does this mean? It means that when you use this technique, you can only get the minimum mass of the planet. You can say that, okay, the mass of the planet is one Jupiter mass, for example, at least one Jupiter mass, but it could be more, okay? So that's great. So we can get this minimum mass based on the mass of the star, the velocity or radial velocity, the orbital period, and so on. So here is a full equation for the radial velocity. A K1 on this left-hand side is the radial velocity, the velocity in you know, meters per second. And it depends upon the eccentricity, mass of the star, mass of the planet, orbital period, and so on. So here is a problem for you all. You can just sub put in values here. M2 is the mass of the planet. M1 is the mass of the star. M jupe is the you know, units in Jupiter mass. So you can use Jupiter mass there. M solar, which is the dot at the sun, is the uh, sun's mass. P is orbital period uh, that you would find. And E is the eccentricity of the planet. Here is a problem for you. Uh, so if you are an alien observing our solar system with the radial velocity technique, what is the value of K1 in meters per second uh, for Jupiter around the sun-like star, okay? So what you need to do is you have to put in the mass of the 
Jupiter in M2, you need to put M1, uh, the mass of the star, which is our sun in there. Um, and the inclination angle, you know, you can put it as uh, 90 degrees because otherwise the whole equation becomes zero if you put I equal to zero. So put I equal to 90 degrees and figure out what the value of K1 is for the Jupiter mass planet around a sun-like star. Do the same thing for what is the value of K1 for Earth around the sun. So put M2 as Earth mass and try to figure out the value of K1. And let's say if my rate, I have developed a radial velocity instrument. And if my instrument has a precision of one meters per second, which planet above is easier to detect and why? And you can also answer another question. Why did we discover the first exoplanet, a Jupiter-sized planet in a four-day orbit? Why didn't we discover a 12-year orbit? Okay. So what you can do here is that instead of putting the orbital period of uh, Jupiter here, put a four-day orbital period and keep the mass of the Jupiter same, M2 same, uh, and find out K1. And you will see why we found out uh, the first exoplanet to be a Jupiter-sized planet very close to the star. Okay. Um, so here is the thing. I, okay. So how do we get the inclination angle? Right. So how do we get the inclination angle? Uh, if radial velocity technique cannot give you the inclination angle because it can, it, it is not possible with that. Um, so we need to find out an inclination angle using some other technique, uh, some other way. And that's where the transit detection technique comes in. The transit detection technique is where the planet passes in front of the star. And because the star has some brightness, it, the planet blocks the light. And because the planet blocks the light, uh, you will see a dip in the star light as the planet passes in, the, in front of the star. And the dip is proportional to the size of the planet. A bigger planet causes a larger dip because it covers more area on the star's uh, uh, brightness. Okay, so as you can see here, this is an Earth-like planet going in around the star, in front of the star, and the Jupiter-sized planet here causes a lot deeper dip in the light coming from the star. It's because of uh, how, uh, how much cross-section, how much area it is uh, blocking it. Okay, so if the planet, that happens only when the planet's inclination angle orbital plane is very aligned with uh, our view angle then the planets will transit and it passes in front of the star. And actually, you know, the planet actually goes in front of the star and also goes behind the star like this. And that's called a secondary eclipse. We will come to that at some point. So you will have a, a primary uh, transit. It's called primary uh, transit. Uh, uh, you, the planet goes in front of the star and then it goes behind the star too. It's called secondary eclipse. And you can see that you can even get that light just before it enters behind the star. Uh, at some point. So there are, this is a detection technique. Uh, it happens, we can see the transits only when the uh, inclination angle is 90 degrees to our line of sight. So now we know the inclination angle, I equal to 90 degrees. So for every transiting planet, we can use radial velocity technique and assume I equal to 90 and figure out the mass. Even better, we will know the mass from the radial velocity technique because we know the inclination angle from transits, if we have the transits. But transits also give the size of the planet. So you know the mass, you know the size, the radius. If you know the mass and the radius together, you can find the density. Now you know something about the planet. If you know the density, you, will, you can figure out, okay, how dense is it? Uh, you know, the density of Jupiter is lower than the density of the Earth. So it, you can figure out if the planet is more Earth-like density or more gas-like planet density. So this is a very crucial information. We can get it out of it. Okay, so not every system transits. Why? Because it depends on luck. Transit probability, the probability of transiting system depends upon the size of the star, which is the radius of the star, and how far away the planet is from the star. And so you can see here, um, we will, you can see that uh, the radius uh, of the star and the, uh, the distance from the planet uh, are very highly depend upon how probable the planet transits uh, around it. Um, not only that, when you are blocking the star, uh, as I said, you can get the radius of the planet too. You can, you can see the flux drop, the change in the flux drop gives you the uh, radius of the planet uh, based on this equation, the square of the radius. So here is another fun problem for you all. Uh, find out what is the transit probability of Jupiter around the sun. 
you will know you know the star the sun's radius the star's radius you know a which is a semi major axis uh, which essentially is how far jupiter is from the sun find out that take the ratio and see what the probability is for a jupiter uh, uh, around the sun do the same thing for earth around the sun also find the drop in the stellar flux for jupiter around the sun i showed you that equation there and also the drop in the earth uh, stellar flux for earth around the sun uh, so then you have all these things right so now what is the transit probability if jupiter lies 100 times closer distance to the sun and what is the drop in stellar flux okay so in in this equation you know a the semi major axis uh, for jupiter we already know you know you can use kepler's laws to convert the 12 year orbit of jupiter into some semi major axis what happens if jupiter is uh, you know 100 times closer to the sun so the value of a would be 100 times uh, smaller than the jupiter's use that and find also the drop in the stellar flux uh, for a planet that is 100 times closer to the sun so we then answer this question which kind of planets are easier to detect so then you will see why we will why we are detecting those kind of planets more and more and uh, so on uh there there are uh, different uh, ways we can do transit uh, techniques uh, uh, well there's a way this is how we actually do the transit technique uh it is uh, first of all uh, we, we can develop a model to see if once we collect the data we can use this model to fit the data and see how uh the how what kind of parameters we can extract from the data uh, so there is a transit geometry here a figure that i'm uh, drawing here you don't need to understand the whole thing uh, there is a point where the planet just comes inside the disk of the star goes into uh, uh, you know crosses the disk of the star and then just leaves the disk of the star so there are certain points along that transit path uh, we can find out that information and uh, uh, find out how long that's called a transit duration how long the planet takes transit across the uh, disk of the star and we can use that information to model the transits that we observe with our telescope great but that is not how when we collect the data that is not how the transits look like this is what we see on the left hand side they look like a bucket they don't look like the square uh, kind of a you know drawing what is happening? Why are we getting this bucket shape like uh, the transit uh, data? This is the data. Whereas our models that we can model look like this. Um, the reason for that is something called limp darkening. It is because uh, you can see in this figure, it arises due to the variation in the temperature and uh, the opacity, which means the thickness uh, with the altitude in the stellar atmosphere along the edges. So for a star, if you're looking at a, a sun, for example, and which you can resolve clearly, uh, when you can do that, you will see that the limb of the star is darker compared to the central part of the star. That's because the optical depth or the light coming from the uh, edges of the star, the limb of the star, takes a longer path to come to us. And so you, will, oh, you can only see the cooler regions of the star around the limb, whereas from the center of the star, it directly comes to us. And so it can we can see deeper, hotter regions. That's why it looks brighter at the center. So when the planet is crossing in front of the star, you will see that uh, those uh, sharp edges are not the ones that uh, we see, like in our model, are not the ones we see. Uh, because of this variation in the brightness of the star itself, we see this very slow, gradual descent of the, uh, uh, of the starlight drop as the planet transits in front of the star. And you can see in this animation, what happens if we keep changing the limb darkening of the star and how does the transit uh, changes from a square to a, a bucket shape like one, okay? So this is an example uh, figure of limb darkening for uh, our sun. You can see around the edges of the sun, it's darker, whereas the central part is the brighter. So this actually affects the way the light curve looks <coughs> for transit technique. Okay, we talked about uh, transit techniques so far, but there are other techniques that people use to detect and also to uh, observe the atmospheres of the planets. 
Uh, that one is the direct imaging uh, uh, technique. Um, this is the first thing that comes to our mind when we say that, okay, we want to look at a, an exoplanet. Uh, this is the first thing that comes to mind because what is that, you know, our telescopes, we can just point to the star and then bam, we can find a planet, right? Well, here is an example. On the left-hand side, uh, this was taken by Cassini spacecraft when it went to the Saturn uh, and turned around, took a picture of the Earth from Saturn's uh, orbit. And you can see Saturn's rings there and Saturn, the Saturn over there. And you can see Earth also pointed by that arrow. It's a so tiny one. That's the light reflected, reflected light <coughs> coming from the Earth, uh, the light coming from the sun. All right. So on the right hand side is a picture of Earth from the distance of Pluto taken by Voyager 1. And I will leave it up to you to find out where Earth is in this photograph on the right. OK, uh, because that's how tiny Earth is, reflected light from Earth is. And, and uh, this, there are other planets uh, uh, that you know, I'm not showing you here. But this is how tiny the light of a planet would be when compared to the star. And this is just from Pluto's distance to look at Earth. Imagine looking at exoplanets that are light years away around a, <coughs> around a star. Uh, and finding a planet with uh, this kind of a direct imaging technique. So the reason why we cannot find planets directly, uh, if we just point out point our telescopes to the stars is because they are bright. How bright are they? We can keep saying, oh yeah, it's too bright and all. Well, how bright are they? Well, at optical wavelengths, in the wavelengths that we see, uh, the star outshines the planet by about a billion times, about 10 to the nine times roughly uh, than the planet itself, the, the star is so bright. Um, and, and, and that's an extremely bri bright uh, one. So here is an exercise for you. You all probably learn about the Planck function or even Dr. Camber, we talked about this, black body radiation, right? So the Planck's law. Uh, use, uh, uh, you know, create a Planck function for both the sun and the earth and find the ratio of the Planck uh, irradiance, uh, the Planck's value. Uh, at a 0.5 micron <clears throat> wavelength, optical wavelength region. How bright, that ratio tells you how bright the sun is compared to the earth. How bright is the sun compared to the earth at this wavelength? You'll see why you know, it is so hard uh, to detect planets uh, with direct imaging technique without any uh, filters or anything. But we did find planets around other stars in with using uh, direct imaging techniques, but those are all, all the ones that are very bright, very far away from the star. Uh, we will come to that when we talk about the direct imaging technique. And the way to find planets around direct imaging with direct imaging is you mask the starlight with some of uh, something called coronagraph or some other way uh, so that you remove all the glare and you can see the planet on the right hand side. Okay, so this is not as easy as I'm just making it to be here, but this is what people are doing now. And uh, in future, in the next couple of decades, uh, we are launching, um, NASA is launching, a, 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 you know, big telescopes, uh, uh, a big size telescope into space, where we are going to point to a star, we use this masking technique called uh, coronagraphic technique, and then we can see the light coming from the star, uh, from the planet itself. So then we can you take that light, split it into spectra, and see what kind of gases are there in the atmosphere of the planet. And that's how we find uh, how, what kind of a planet uh, it is and what kind of, uh, you know, if there is life on it or not. Um, there is another technique called gravitational microlensing. Um, I'll just, this is just one slide for that. Uh, we, there is a, uh, the way this technique works is that if you have a background star, which is where, what you see here, uh, this background star, uh, if it is being uh, eclipsed by a foreground star with a planet, uh, let me see if I can uh, replay this. Okay. If the star with the uh, planet is in the foreground in front of it, as the planet, a star and the planet are coming closer or uh, blocking the background star, the intensity increases because of the gravitational lensing. Of the graph of the of the uh, the foreground star, uh, and then they see you see a peak in the brightness 
just like a micro lensing event uh, in, in, in uh, general relativity. You see bright in the preetness for the star as the first star goes in, uh, in front of it. And then the plan, as the planet also follows it, you'll see a tiny bump in the increase of uh, the brightness of the background star. And you will see, and be based on that uh, tiny bump, you can figure out the, the mass and the, the mass of the planet and figure out what kind of a planet it is. Uh, there are some uh, planets that were discovered using this technique. Okay. <clears throat> So though, until now, I've discussed about only the detection techniques. Now I'm going to go into the, uh, uh, the statistics of planets uh, that we will be observing. Uh, I'm going to pause here and see if anybody has any questions on the detection techniques. Uh, I can see the chat though, maybe. So there are a few questions actually. Okay. Yeah. So uh, there is a question by Tejas so Oken. He is asking that is there a limiting mass ratio for which radial velocity technique is effective? And uh, yeah, there is okay. one more followed question uh, for the same. So let me address that first. Uh, what when we when you when you are talking about the radial velocity equation, is there a limiting mass ratio? Um, for the, it depends on the instrument detectability, yeah, instrument sensitivity rather. So if your instrument is sensitive to uh, a certain value of radial velocity amplitude, the, the value of the velocity in meters per second, let's say one meters per second, then you need, uh, you need to find a star planet combination that can give you uh, the radial velocity value above or at the value of one meters per second. If you have a star planet combination that falls below your sensitivity of the instrument, you will not be able to detect that, obviously, because it is buried in the noise. The, the amplitude will be so small that your instrument is not sensitive to it. <clears throat> okay, so this question is followed by one more that is uh, the, by the same person that if the barrier center is very close to the star, then the red blue shifts would be, would, uh, be very low. Yes, I mean, that is essentially what happens if you have a uh, sun-like star and only Earth-like, Earth-sized planet or even moon-sized planet, for example. It is not be possible because the bubble would be very, very tiny and your instrument has to be extremely, extremely uh, sensitive to even the tiniest wobble and it's really, really hard to do that. So, yes. So, uh, there is one question about the image that you have shown that what is the dark patch planet like at the top right corner of the picture shown while explaining the limb darkening of oh. the sun. I believe you're talking about this. Let me close this. I believe you're talking about this. That's uh, Venus. Okay. Yeah, this question was by Priyanka. Okay. Any other question? No question we can take maybe. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. So there is a question by Jibran and he's asking that I read we use infrared wavelength for direct imaging. Why not any other wavelength telescope? Contrary to I, from what we have uh, working on, we use uh, optical wavelengths. When I say optical wavelengths for direct imaging, uh, the wavelength uh, range actually from UV to near, near infrared. So I mentioned that NASA is building a big telescope to look at uh, planets to mask the star and find a planet in direct imaging, right? That telescope uses a wavelength range from 0.2 microns to 2 microns. 0.2 micron is a UV region, okay, ultraviolet region. And so it will cover 0.2 microns to up to 2 micron, and the 2 micron is a near infrared. So we don't only use near infrared, uh, infrared uh, part of the spectrum. We use from UV to near infrared. Certain uh, telescopes use certain kind of uh, uh, instruments that are sensitive in those wavelengths. But at least uh, most of the telescopes that I know are trying to do, do this in the optical. Yeah. Uh, just one question related to radial velocity now. That can can you find the number of exoplanets by just the radial velocity method? Can you find the number of exoplanets with just radial velocity method? Uh, Anusha Duke, can you unmute yourself and ask like? 
if the question is not clear. I guess she wants to ask that is the radial velocity method, you know, uh, is the only method to use uh, to find the number of exoplanets? Uh, not necessarily, which is why I'm coming to the next slide. <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, if that is the question, Anusha, uh, then uh, here is the answer to that. That was my next slide. So this is a, a plot of uh, uh, discovery year on the x-axis and how many number of planets are being discovered by each detection techniques over the years. You can see that the red ones are the radial velocity technique detected uh, planets, uh, the, the pink ones, and green ones are the transit detection technique. They, uh, we used to use, find the transit detection technique. And those are the green ones. And you can see that, yes, the two dominant methods uh, that were used to find most of the exoplanets were uh, transits, which are green, the first one. And the next uh, highest one is the radial velocity one. So that should probably answer that question. So yeah, you can see there are more than 5,000 planets discovered so far by both the techniques. And there are some other techniques that we used, you know, in blue microlensing, uh, transit timing variations, imaging, direct imaging, that's what it means, and so on. But those are all tiny in the, but most of dominant techniques are transit green and the radial velocity in the pink. Sound good? I'm going to go ahead uh, because anyway, we are at this uh, plot. Oops, let's see. Okay, so as you can see here, let's go back to a slide here. Green ones are where transit detection techniques were, uh, was used to uh, discover most of the planets, right? Uh, and uh, why is it so? Why transit method was used so, um, so vigorously to find these planets and not radial velocity? Because in 2009, NASA launched uh, a mission called Kepler, where the telescope pointed at one part of the sky, stared at it for many, many years. And this is an animation that shows that that patch is the array of uh, where the, the telescope pointed to. It detectors were covering one region. And if you just focus on one small part of that detector region, uh, there are like thousands and thousands of stars. And uh, uh, Kepler was able to find planet around one of those, uh, you know, that is just a sample. It found many, many hundreds of planets there. But, you know, it, you can see that it found many planets around that uh, in that region. And because Kepler looked at that kind, uh, that region and found thousands and thousands of planets, that's why you see in the, uh, you saw in the previous plot that the radial velocity, uh, sorry, the transit technique uh, in the green uh, discovered so many uh, thousands of planets before well, compared to the radial velocity. Okay, so this is just a, another picture of where Kepler was searching for planets. Uh, this is a, a picture of our galaxy. And, uh, you know, Kepler was looking at only one small region, the light beam you see here, the light beam uh, around the sun uh, is where we see just the Kepler search space. Uh, there's also another one called TESS uh, uh, that came recently that also was looking around the sun, solar neighborhood. But it, none of the telescopes that we have launched until now have, dis have probed every, the, the whole galaxy. It is impossible to do that. So what do we do? How do we know how many planets are in our galaxy if we are just looking at one part of the uh, of the of the galaxy? Well, that's the way we do that is the way we do census uh, of population census in uh, our real world. Uh, so let's say you want to have an opinion of something like you know this. Uh, do you like color red or blue or you know do you think the roads in Pune are good or not or something? then you don't, you don't have the capability or you don't have time to probe every single person in Pune. So what you do is that you randomly call some people or you select some hundred people or something, take their opinion and you say that, okay, we collected uh, some information from these hundred people and this we think represents generally the opinion of all Pune people. And so, uh, and we can extrapolate our uh, results for the whole population. Same thing we do with this uh, uh, planet searches as well. We collect data from the small area of the galaxy. And we say that 
Okay, so we found uh, that uh, these many out of the hundred planets we found, these many stars have, uh, you know, these many planets are Jupiter size, these many planets are Earth size, and these many planets are Neptune size or so and whatever. And, and then we said, okay, because we found uh, from this one, we can extrapolate the, for the whole galaxy and see that this fraction is applicable to every part of the galaxy. What, and from there, we found that um, this is called an occurrence rate, planet occurrence. We found that almost every star in our galaxy has a planet around it. Uh, so every plan, every star in our galaxy has a planet. So imagine this, our galaxy at the minimum has 100 billion stars. Uh, that's about 10,000 crores of stars in our galaxy. And it looks like almost every star has one planet at least. So we have at least 10,000 crore planets in our galaxy uh, at the minimum, because our sun has, doesn't have one planet. It has nine plan or eight planets right now, right? So imagine there could be at least 10,000 crore planets, but could be even more, quite a bit more. Um, so what kind of planets are out there then? Well, uh, this is uh, one of the important and uh, very strange thing we found recently that in our solar system, we have uh, the biggest uh, terrestrial planet is Earth. And after that, the next biggest one is Neptune or Uranus. There's nothing in between. However, Kepler found that there are super Earths and mini Neptunes, some planets that are in between the sizes of the Earth and the Neptune. Uh, and and those are we don't know what they are. I mean, like we don't have an equivalent uh, planet in our solar system. It's like finding uh, you know a human, uh, a Neanderthal human in the midst of all modern humans. We just don't have that kind of a person in our among us right, anymore, right? Some ancient species of human we found out. So apparently, galaxy has so many of them that it is the most dominant. These planets, super Earths and mini Neptunes, are the most dominant kind of planets in our galaxy. However, we don't have it. It's like uh, everyone has a, a cousin or a sister or a brother, but you know, surprisingly, we don't have this kind of a cousin or a brother or sister. And so, this is a, again solar system, but putting in the super Earths and mini Neptunes in perspective. Why don't we have it? Nobody knows. Why did we? Or maybe it's the Detecting these planets, mini Neptunes and super Earths, are a sign of our detection techniques being sensitive to these kind of planets. And maybe that's why, but that doesn't explain why we do not have one. Apparently, they are the most dominant ones, some of the most dominant ones. And how do you know those are the most dominant ones? Well, here is a distribution fraction of that. So far, we found more than 5,000 planets, exoplanets. Out of that, 30% are gas giants. 35% uh, are Neptunes, and 31% are super Earths. About one third of 5,000 planets we found are actually super Earth kind of planets. And you can see that the terrestrial planets, which are Earth like or Earth sized planets, are only 4%. And you may think, oh, that means probably Earth like planets are rare. No. Remember that the detection techniques are sensitive to large planets and uh, close to the stars because that's how we use the detection. It's like your eyes sensitive to only things in the visible region. You won't be able to see the things that are in the infrared part of the spectrum, right? But some bees or snakes can see in the infrared part of the spectrum. So you're missing out a lot of other things. So this is what happened with our thing, uh, with our terrestrial planets too. Even though we see only 4% over here, um, the estimates are that terrestrial planets actually dominate most of the exoplanets, every other category of exoplanets. There are more terrestrial planets, Earth-like or Earth-sized planets, not Earth-like. Earth-sized planets, there are way, way more of them than Neptune, super Earths, or gas giants. And so because it's an estimate of that, because we are missing so many of them because our detection techniques are not sensitive to these small planets that are far away from the sun, like us. OK, so then the question is, how common are these potential habitable or habitable zone planets, small Earth-sized planets that we saw? How common are they? We know how common are other kinds of planets are there. So we published a paper last year, uh, the occurrence of habitable zone, rocky habitable zone planets around solar system like stars, solar-like stars, uh, is with my colleagues, Steve Bryson and all. Uh, you can find this paper at this location. I'll make it available. Um, 
the talk will be available so you can look at it. Go to section 4, 5.4 of this. I did this calculation for this paper. Um, there and, and there, there are steps uh, how I describe how, how we can get these numbers. Uh, what we found is that the nearest habitable zone planet, uh, Earth-sized planet around a sun-like star, a G star is called a sun-like star, uh, like our sun, is only six parsecs or about 20 light years away. So the nearest habitable zone planet to us, to Earth, around a sun-like star is only 20 light years away. And there may be seven habitable zone planets within 30 light years of the sun, our sun. And so this is extremely, extremely interesting, probably. It, that this does not mean that there will be seven of them. This is our estimate at the minimum that there are seven habitable zone planets within the uh, 30 light years. And these are the most conservative estimates, which means at, at least we, we, we try to reduce as much as we can and try to see, okay, what is the minimum, minimum number of planets we can find? That's seven within uh, 10 parsecs or 30 light years. Um, so here is an exercise for you. Go to that section 5.4 and reproduce these numbers. You will see the math there and estimate them for K stars. There are tables over there in the paper and estimate these numbers for K stars. And you'll see how common are habitable zone planets around K stars or even for M stars, okay? All right, so I'm going to, pause, I probably end at this point, and I'm going to give you a very brief uh, 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 view of what's going to come soon. We will be talking at some point uh, in the in these lectures about habitable zones. Uh, what is a habitable zone? Why is it important for search for life? And if we are searching for life, what kind of signatures are we looking for? Those are called biosignatures, the signatures of biology, that's like plants, animals, and you know everything on the earth. And we will also talk about techno signatures, uh, the science of technology. How do we find science of technology on other planets? Like I said, this all may sound like science fiction. Well, welcome to the future. We are in the future right now. This science fiction is now science. So like I said, in the next decade or couple of decades, we will know uh, how many habitable planets are there and we will be able to see if there is an alien life or not. Um, so I'll pause here and uh, take uh, questions. I want to open this for discussion and we can have quite a, we have some time for discussion here. Uh, yes, so we can, uh, we can also ask participants now to unmute and ask because that will help for interaction. Yeah. yeah. So uh, we have opened the option for unmuting. Hello, sir. Uh, um, I'm Arupal, right? Yeah. Please tell uh, your name and then you can ask your question. Yeah, sir. My name is Arun. Uh, I have a doubt that it's a very um, simple question. Actually, uh, so, uh, why the planets that are closer to the star, I mean, for our sun, are rocky and that are far away are gaseous? And why those uh, planets that are far away are spinning so fast? So, I understood the first part of the question, which is why is it that uh, planets in our solar system have a rocky in the beginning and uh, gaseous uh, 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 towards the outer parts of the solar system, right? Um, for that for that one, uh, it's the, it depends on the formation mechanism. Um, we have, a, there are different uh, ways of plant formation models. One model says that uh, there is not enough material at the, uh, in the very close to the sun because it's so hot you cannot condense uh, ma uh, materials to form, to come together and collect together to form bigger, bigger objects. Because it's so hard, they won't condense enough, right? As you go further and further away from the star, from the sun, it be, the, you know, it, it's not as hot, there is not much radiation. And so the other metals and other materials can condense into tiny particles, and those particles can come together, form bigger objects. So that's one model to explain our solar system. But then, uh, as we have seen, uh, the first exoplanet that was discovered was a hot Jupiter, a four-day Jupiter-sized object in a four-day orbit. So if my if my theory is right that uh, uh, it is so hot close to the sun that uh, we can't condense uh, uh, enough particles to form bigger objects, well, how come this planet formed in a four-day orbit that is close to the sun, right? 
And the way and the answer to that is that there is another mechanism that planets actually form outside quite far away, uh, these bigger Jupiter sized planets, but then they migrate in uh, closer to the star. And then they come as close as they can until they survive. And then they, that's what we detect right now. The migrating means that they're coming closer because there was gas disk uh, in the, at the formation point. And so when the when a Jupiter sized planet forms at further away from the star, because there is still gas around it when during the formation, uh, the gas drag causes friction and slowly the planet spirals in and comes closer to the star. And that's what we see right now as a hot Jupiter. Does that answer your question, Arun? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Yep. Okay, so we can see hands raised. So Sakshi, Sakshi Gupta. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Yeah. So uh, my question is, what are all the necessary conditions uh, which uh, I mean the community defined as the planet is habitable or not? I mean, after the analysis of uh, all those conditions, you comment whether it is inhabitable zone or not. So what are the necessary conditions for that? So you will learn this uh, hopefully in the uh, lectures where when we talk about a habitable zone, but I'll give you a brief intro to that, uh, brief, brief dis description of that one. Uh, so habitable in the definition of uh, exoplanet field is that a planet should have liquid water on the surface under the right conditions. Why am I on the, uh, insisting liquid water on the surface? Uh, that's, a, that's a habitable planet, okay? Uh, and the reason why I, we keep insisting that uh, the definition of the habitable zone, let me just give you that. The definition of the habitable zone, it is the region around the star where uh, Earth-sized planet or Earth-mass planet can have liquid water on the surface under the right temperature and pressure conditions. So that's a very carefully crafted definition. It's the region around a star habitable zone. It's the region around a star where right uh, a pla earth sized planet will have liquid water on the surface under right conditions. Why liquid water on the surface? Liquid water is essential component for everything in the life that we know of. That the kind of life we know requires liquid water, no matter what. And so we are looking for that kind of life. You may ask, why should we look for only that kind of life? Why can't we look for some other life? We can't because our, we don't know, we, we don't know what to look for if we don't know how it looks. Our brains are like that. Our human evolution is like that. And so uh, I'll give you another example. If you are going, if you are invited to a party by your friend uh, and you don't know anyone over there, what is the first thing you do? You go to someone you already know there and try to strike up a conversation, right? That's what we are doing. We are trying to find planets that have liquid water because we, that's the only kind of life we know. And then we will start, uh, you know, extrapolating for other kind of life. Okay, so why liquid water on the surface? Because uh, these planets are quite far away from us. Uh, if you have liquid water on Mars, or if you have <coughs> liquid water under the surface of uh, Jupiter's moons, well, I can send probes there. NASA can send probes there. ISRO can send probes there. Big stuff. But we don't have that kind of luxury to send probes to exoplanets. All we can do is right, look at the light coming from the planet or the star and figure out what is there on the planet. And uh, the idea here is that if you have liquid water on the surface of a planet that's far away, there may be life on the surface using that liquid water. And that life releases some gases into the atmosphere. And we can look at that atmosphere with our telescopes. And that's why we insist on the liquid water on the surface. So that's the definition of a habitable planet. A planet should have liquid water under the right conditions on the surface of the planet. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, so next we have uh, Pratik Dabhade. Can you unmute yourself? Uh, hi, so could you please explain the transit geometry diagram once again, please? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, where is it? Let me see. This one? Yes, yes. Okay, so I didn't go through this much because uh, without an actual equation here, <clears throat> which I did, I skipped it. Uh, uh, the, the, there are ways to uh, find out what is the, uh, the uh, transit duration, how much time does it take, and, uh, and the transit uh, depth, that's the delta F1. And so the ingress and egress numbers that I showed here are crucial uh, in, try, in trying to find the duration of the transit. Okay, 
And so the ingress is where the planet is just touching after it enters into the disk of the star, it's just, just touching the uh, outer boundary of the star. That's number two, that's the ingress one, okay? And that's where we think the actual full depth of the transit starts. Before that, the, as the planet is crossing the disk, that's the one, when one comes and becomes two uh, over here, you can see the a slope of the drop in the flux of the star because the planet is still transiting the disk of the star. And the same thing can be applied when you are seeing the egress, the, the planet is leaving the star. And three is that egress one and four is where it's completely out of it. And you, you, you can use this geometry based on the radius of the planet and, uh, uh, sorry, uh, based on the uh, ingress and egress of the planet, you can figure out uh, that transit duration and uh, uh, the transit, uh, uh, total transit time. Oh, uh, so if you want more information on this one, uh, look at Exoplanets book, edited by Sarah Seeger, 2010 year. Uh, there is a chapter. There are chapters of various detection techniques in that book. Exoplanets, edited by Sarah Seeger. I'll type it up in the uh, chat. Does it answer your question? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Oh, yeah. So Exoplanets 2010, edited by... Okay, so let's go to the next one. Yeah, next, uh, I can see Priyatam. Can you unmute yourself? Uh, hello, I am Priyatam. So uh, actually, uh, last uh, week I read a paper, uh, uh, not a paper, uh, presentation from a, uh, other candidates. Uh, she is explaining about the transit methods and she is considering also the brightness of the planet. So I want to ask you that, uh, is it possible to uh, uh, get the light curve of both the stars as well as the surrounding planet? Uh, yes, so I'm just, I'm, I went off the uh, uh, sharing screen because I'm searching for, I should have included it actually. Um, so I have it uh, here. Uh, open link in a new tab. And then I'll show you a secondary eclipse uh, light curve also at the same time, the primary. Okay, there you go. Okay, let me share <clears throat> my screen again. Can you all see this screen? Yes, it is visible. Okay, great. So the black thing is a planet transiting in front of a star. Okay, so that's the one that we just talked about. Uh, what I didn't explain is something called a secondary eclipse. The planet, uh, I think I probably mentioned this, the planet is going behind the star and uh, you can see it is red or orange in color because you are see when the planet is going behind the star, just about to go behind the star, you will see the day side of the planet, which is the most irradiated side from the star because the starlight is you know, all over the planet there as it just going behind the star. So you can get that in a light as well. Notice that what happens is when you, uh, this is the uh, secondary eclipse uh, uh, light curve. First of all, when you are looking at, when you are pointing your telescope towards a uh, star and a planet, you are getting light from both of them, not just the star, okay? And so when you're getting light from both of them, you see this flat light, uh, flat uh, light curve. And when the planet is transiting, which is that black curve, when it is blocking the star, then you see this big dip going down because there's a large fraction of the light is being blocked by the planet, right? Because the star is the most brightest thing there. Uh, and so, and when the planet comes out of that uh, transit, you again see this flat line, which is both the light coming from the star and the planet because the planet is going on the side. So you get the light from the planet, light from the star. However, when the planet is going just behind the star, and it goes behind the star, for example, there is no light coming from the planet. You're missing that light. And so you see a small dip here at the top, you'll see eclipse. You'll see a very tiny dip of that light drop in the light. And that tiny drop in the light is because the light from the planet is missing. That's the secondary eclipse. And if you zoom in, this plot below shows how much of the depth is. You can figure out um, the size of the planet based on that. You can also figure out if you take a spectrum, uh, what kind of a temperature the planet has uh, up to a certain depth and so on. Does that answer your question, Pritam? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Yep. Next, uh, Meghna, can you unmute yourself? Yes, ma'am. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Um, 
and your dog as well. Meghna? Yes. yes. Hello. <laughs> yes. Uh, okay. Hi. Um, I have two questions. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm still not very clear about gravitation microlensing. So could you explain that again? And yes. I had another question which was related to the architecture of our solar system. Can we comment whether it's unique or not? Or like, how can we find out about that? Right, right. So, um, so for the gravitational microlensing, let me go back to the... <clears throat> Um, this where is my presentation here? Uh, this one. Um, so in this case, what happens is there is a background star which is what you see at the center. That's not moving. That's a background star. That's in the back. Okay, and the foreground star is the one that is with the planet is yellow on the left hand side. Uh, as the foreground star comes into the, uh, you know, in front of the background star, what will happen is uh, you see the, again, it's similar to transit. You see the light coming uh, from both the stars. Uh, actually coming uh, without, when there is no background, when, the, when there is no foreground star, you see only light coming from the background star that's not moving. What happens is when the foreground star is coming closer and closer, you see, okay, I'm going to pause it. You see this increase in the light intensity, brightness, because now you are getting light from both the stars. Okay. However, there's also something here where the gravitational field of the uh, foreground star with the planet is uh, increasing the brightness of the background star uh, because there's a lensing effect that happens from general theory of relativity, space time is curved around these high gravity objects uh, like, uh, like the star. And so you will start seeing the increase in brightness because of this lensing method, a lensing event. And so initially you'll see this bright increase uh, of the background star, go, the light coming from the background star, you know, bends around the foreground star. And then that's the increase in the intensity you'd see. And that's what you see this increase in intensity first. And once the star passes away, uh, you you know the peak is gone, so it goes down when the star is going away. However, the st the planet also has a tiny gravitational field around it, right? It gra it's a gravity object, and so light has to bend around that as well, and and increase its brightness. It's magnifying that the light the light coming uh, around the planet, and so you see this tiny wow, this is blocking it, and that's why you see this tiny bump in the magnification because the planet's gravity also has, gra it's also, it also has a gravitational field. The light bends around even the tiny gravitational field to increase the brightness. Does that address your question? Uh, yes, it does. Thank you. I had a second question. It was about the, how the architecture of our solar system is and whether we can comment if it's unique or not. Okay. so. We don't know if our solar system is unique or not. Imagine, <clears throat> why am I saying that? Because uh, so far we all found, uh, you know, these kind of small plan, uh, large planets closer to the stars because our detection techniques are sensitive to them. To find uh, a planetary system like our solar system, first of all, Earth is a one year orbit around the sun, which means that it will take one, we need at least one year's worth of orbit to collect the data. And in Jupiter is 12 year orbit. So we need at least 12 years worth of data from all the stars, many, many stars to see if how many of them are like our solar system. And then comes Saturn, Neptune, and you know, Uranus and Neptune. They have, you know, hundreds of years of orbits to find out if the, you know, to get the data from those kind of systems. So we are not yet there to even answer the question at this point. We are only at the point where we can say, okay, how common are Venus-like planets because we have data up to that Venus-like planet systems. And Earth-like planet systems, we are just getting them now. So is that answer your question now? Yes, yeah. thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. So uh, Meghna, Meghna Mishra? Yes, I'm audible. Yeah. Yes, you're yes sir. so if we study like the properties of stars specifically, can they help us in predicting the kind of planetary system they're going to host? 
Um, there were a couple of attempts to do that. Uh, what they were trying to do is they were trying to find the metallicity, how metal rich the star is. And yes. some uh, you know, papers claim that uh, if you have a higher metallicity, that means you can form more planets around it because you have more material from the formation cloud, okay? Because okay. more metal rich means that you have different kinds of more uh, uh, material available to make more planets. General trend seems to be the case that you, if, they, if the plan, if stars are more metal rich, then you would have more planets. You have planets around them. If the star is metal poor, then there are, it is less likely that you will have planets around them. And that's what the trend they have found. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks. So next we have Anushka Doke. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Uh, yeah, um, so my question was, uh, using the radial velocity method, can you detect multiple exoplanets in the same stellar system? Certainly. How do you do that? Uh, by looking at, uh, do I have a plot of that? So when you are detecting, uh, okay, so let me see. Okay, so here, let me uh, play this. This is a very simple diagram uh, animation I'm showing here. There's only one planet around the star. And so you will just see a nice sine curve, okay? And this is a circular orbit. So you'll see a nice sine curve around it. It's a very simplistic model, but that's not what reality happens. In reality, you get data, when you are taking the spectrum of the star, all you get is the light from the star, right? And the star is being affected by all the planets, not just one planet. So what people do is they collect the data from the star and then what they try to model, they'll, they'll get a curve like this, a sinusoidal curve, like something similar to this, not like this, because there will be effect of eccentricity, there will be effect of all other planets. So if the curve will be you know, somewhat skewed. So what they do is, okay, First, they'll say, okay, I'm going to put a sign curve like this and see if it fits my data. Uh, if it doesn't, that means that there is must be some other planet in there. So they add one more planet and the sign curve changes a little bit. And then they try to fit the data again. And then they'll say, okay, it's not fitting yet. Okay, now I'm putting another planet with another mass, some other different mass, and then they try to fit it. Then, you know, they'll say, okay, this is a reasonable fit. That means the planet system may have three planets and so on. And does that answer your question? Yes, yes. Thank you. Okay. Okay, we have maybe two more questions. We have a question by Giridharan. Uh, Giridharan, can you please unmute yourself? Yeah. Uh, am I audible? Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I have this question, like the systems you are observing are like usually very far away. So there should be some kind of associated uncertainties with respect to the data points we collect. So are these data points reasonably huge or like... Uh, you know, are we able to constrain them like really well in some sense, or is it just constrained to how good our telescopes are? Uh, both. The answer is both. Uh, right. so, so the the more data you collect, <clears throat> collect the more uh, easier for you to reduce your error bars on the data, right? Because you have more data, you can put one stack of on another and reduce your noise, right? You get right. more and more signal. However, there is a limit to how, much, how good your instrument is. So right. you can collect like hundreds of hours of data, but your instrument has its inherent uh, limitations. Uh, yes. So there could be heat coming from the instrument that is preventing your data to not go below certain level. I mean, your sensitivity to go below certain level. And so once you reach it, there's nothing you can do. You have to change your instrument. But until then, you can collect more data and reach your limit to the sensitivity and then say that, okay, this is, I've reached it. This is the best I can do. Right. So like collecting the data for multiple transits and overlaying them basically. That's yes. The... Yes. In fact, the transit pro transit method has an, uh, you know, an issue here, uh, which I haven't uh, uh, mentioned. Uh, in the transit method, where is the animation here? Okay. Let me go there. Um, uh, this is a very simple thing. I'm just so showing a planet going in front of the star and then bam, it goes down and then da, you found a planet. That's not how many things. If you look at the Kepler field uh, that we see uh, that the animation showed somewhere here, I don't know where it is now. 
Uh, yes, no. Uh, somewhere here. Oh, uh, no, maybe in the statistics uh, here. This is the Kepler's field, right? Uh, in this Kepler field, there are thousands and thousands of stars. And so what happens is because there are so many stars, there is, oh, someone's background noise. Okay, there are so many stars that uh, there are some background stars that are mimicking the transit. There are some binary stars that can mimic this uh, planet transit. So you will be fooled to think that there will be, there is a planet around the star, but when in case it's actually a binary star in the background. And so what people do for transit technique is that they don't just uh, collect one orbit, they collect three orbits. If you see a repeating pattern multiple times, then yes, there is a planet around it. If you see only one orbit and then it doesn't show, then it's a false positive. Great, yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks, uh, Devasmita, Devi Smita. Hello. Yes. Uh, yes, you're audible. Yes. So I have a uh, I have an idea which um, I need to I need to describe in a length. So I I request you to please bear with me. Um, so you said we are having trouble with finding the habitable exoplanets, as uh, statistics says that um, there could be at least one planet around each star in our galaxy. So. <clears throat> Uh, and we are searching for lives just like other, just like ours. Uh, then I think uh, when life first formed in Earth, I think uh, it has some relationship with the part of the galaxy it was back then. And we can trace back to that region of the galaxy. Uh, so my question is, uh, isn't that part of the galaxy has more probability to sustain lives like ours? And why didn't we point telescopes to that part uh, at first? Um, I mean, unlike randomly pointing uh, everywhere, like all around the sun. So first of so, all, I think if I understand your question, uh, you are saying that there must be a region in our galaxy where life, producing life would be possible. Yeah, because there are also theories which say that life might have come to Earth by meteors and asteroids. Um, well, yeah. Okay. Right. So, so that is a theory. That is a that is not even a theory. That is a hypothesis. Theory is even stronger statement than hypothesis. And so that's a that's a hypothesis. Um, for us to point to a region in our galaxy, our telescopes are not sensitive. We can only go see up to a few parsecs or so. And, uh, and the reason why we Kepler is pointing to this region here uh, uh, in this animation is because it is above the galactic plane. So you will not have crowded field uh, and dust and disk uh, in the disk. Uh, it will not, not be obscured. And it pointed slightly above the uh, galactic uh, plane. And even in that small region is what we found uh, here. Uh, a lot of planets. To look at uh, all the regions where there could be possibility of life. Is hmm? um, yeah. So, to, yeah. So to, to look at uh, every other part of the galaxy would be uh, impossible because we don't we don't have that kind of a telescope, or we'll never be able to do that. And so we are only limited to look at uh, the kind of stars around our galaxy, around our sun, because telescopes are sensitive. The biggest telescope that we have right now can, you know, look at planets in, in the next, in the hundred light years or so. Hundred light years is nothing compared to our galaxy. It's like a pin size around our sun. It's just the limitations, yeah. Yeah, thanks. So- um... Yeah, thank you. Next, we have Kushi, Kushi Arora. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Yes. Okay, so my question is, is there any possibility of having an exoplanet around a binary star system? If yes. So what will be the method of detecting? Okay, same, same thing. Transit detection technique can use, uh, was used many times. Kepler found many binary systems, uh, binary planet systems, sorry, binary star planet systems. So we have a high school student of mine who uh, worked with me discovered a planet around a binary star. Okay. Uh, 
So they have that. Okay, I have one more thought. Yep. Yep. Um, go ahead. What will be the probability of finding or oh, having a life on that? On that kind of planets? Yeah. Uh, your guess is as good as mine. We, <laughs> you know, we don't know. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Yep. Thanks. So, may, uh, can we take two more questions? We can take more if you are. Okay. Yeah. So, we have a question by Priyanka. Priyanka? Hello, sir. Thank you for the wonderful talk. So, uh, I was wondering, like, if uh, we can get confused or how do we differentiate between a stellar spot and the decrease in the flux due to stellar spot or uh, the exoplanet? An very, very good question. Um, we can, there are techniques uh, to remove them uh, because uh, stellar spots can definitely mimic the transits uh, because it's a dark air region in, on, the plan, on the star, right? So it can drop the light of the star. And so uh, there are certain ways we can remove them uh, based on the modeling of the star. We need to know more about the star. And the radial velocity technique also is very sensitive to this kind of uh, stellar spots uh, activity. And so there are techniques to remove them as well, if we know uh, enough about the star and the stellar structure. Okay, thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, Raghav Narsimha? Hello, sir. Yeah. Yes. Sir, can you explain about the false positives, like, like stellar spots and binary star systems? Like, are there any other things? Um, so at least for the transit technique, uh, the background uh, grazing orbit, it's called. Um, so if you have two stars going, at, uh, Dr. Kemper, we talked about it yesterday when he was talking about spectroscopic binaries or visual binaries. When, uh, when a star passes in front of the star, you can see a big drop in the light because it's going, crossing right in front of the star. But if it is not crossing right in front of the star, it's just grazing on the top, then that can mimic the signal of a small planet transiting the star. And then you can be fooled that you know it could be a planet or something, and so that's why we require them to have multiple transits. Uh, for the star spots, the similar thing. We need to know more about the star stellar structure and stellar temperature because the dark spots. Uh, same thing happens with the radial velocity technique. Activity can mimic for radial velocity stellar activity. Uh, you know, flares and uh, coronal mass ejections can mimic the radial velocity uh, signal of a planet. So there are there are methods people know to take how to take care of them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so mostly we are done. We, we don't have any hand raised, but we have one question in the chat box that how James will play effective role in detecting exoplanets using infrared vision. Who is James? James Webb Telescope, I guess. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, James Webb, well, so James Webb is one of the, the, the as far as now we have um, the most uh, powerful telescope we have that operates in the infrared part of the spectrum. It, it is using transit uh, method to look at the atmospheres of the planet. Uh, I may have a, a slide or so that actually tells you how uh, different layers of the atmospheres absorb at different wavelengths and uh, it will create uh, a signal for transit signal that will can tell you something about what kind of gases are there and so uh, it will it is one of the most important telescopes but so that's going to be there uh, so someone said it here i'm not sure my question was answered before yeah uh, how gravitational lensing uh, uh, can we use to detect planets when at least three periods are needed? No, no. Gravitational lensing doesn't need three periods. Transit technique needs three periods. Gravitational lensing, you will not get uh, another opportunity. You, you will only get once. Once the star crosses in front of the background star, it goes away. And that's it. There is no multiple orbits or anything. Our very far and follow-up cannot be done. That's exactly right. We cannot do follow-up for gravitational lensing. It's just a one-time event. You see brightness, and then it goes away. The three three transit uh, three uh, orbital periods for uh, transit technique. Yeah. 
<clears throat> How can we differentiate between moon and the planet with real Oster method? Minimum mass with the minimum mass. And if you know the inclination, you will know the actual mass. Okay, so there are two more questions and then we can pause. Kushi Aurora and Mehta. Uh, so we have one question actually. Yeah. Can I ask? Sure. Yeah, so it's a direct question to me that since there are few techniques to detect the planets through the transit method, uh, transit method is used widely, which uh, one of them is most accurate. Can we use all the methods to constrain the detection, raise the accuracy of detection, or avoid false detection? Um, I wish that were the case. Most of the time, the planets that are detected by radial velocities may not be transiting because it depends on the orientation, right? Every For transit to do, it has to be oriented this way. And so if you detect a system with radial velocity, it is very, very hard to see that uh, same system transiting as well because the geometry, you know, uh, statistically it is not uh, probable for us to do it. For example, we now know at least five habitable zone planets around the sun, around you know stars in, around our sun, five habitable zone planets. None of them are transiting. And they're all detected by rail velocity method. And so if we want to find, uh, reduce the false positives, and if you're saying that we want to use different detection techniques, the planet has to be detected rail velocity. It has to be transiting. And uh, it also, let's say direct imaging, uh, it needs to be ap uh, amenable for direct imaging. I think uh, direct imaging is okay. We can look at it and do it. But to find a system with both transiting and rail velocity is a bit difficult. We know only very few systems like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes, mostly one question I can see interesting here that how can we differentiate between moon and planet with radial velocity method? I just answered that, I think, with the uh, okay, I'm reading uh, it. minimum mass uh, planet, uh, we can do it. Some cushy Aurora has a hand raised. Oh, yeah. Okay. Sir, I have two more questions. Uh, the first question is, how do we calculate the spin rate of an exoplanet? Uh, I think there is a method called rossiter mclaughlin effect, uh, which uh, either for closing planets, you can closing giant planets, you can figure that out based on the uh, the effect of how the star's rotation is. Um, otherwise, we know that planets, if they are very close to the star, they are tidally locked. Oh, that's another lecture I have to give actually. Uh, tidally locked, as in synchronously rotating. One side of the planet is always facing the star, just like the moon is doing right now to us. So there are planets, especially around cool stars, the habitable zone planets around cool stars, there, one side is always, you know, facing the star. Like, oh, if the Earth is facing the sun, like there is sun all the time, no night. Right. So, so there are such planets. Uh, that's then we will know orbital period is same as the rotation period there, and so. We okay. Uh, the second question is like. Uh, 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 one minute. There is a background noise. Uh, if you are not asking question, can you please unmute yourself? Sorry, mute yourself. Yeah. Okay. So, do any set of exoplanets around any star that follows the TTS boot law? There was a there were a couple of papers that were claimed that, but I don't think they are right. Oh. Yeah. That means there are no exoplanets, right? No, 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 no. That is not what. But I said. what's the what was the reason about this? No, no, yeah, yeah. So, so that's not what I said. I said mm. I don't think it is true that. Uh, Exoplanets follow TTS board law. But but why? Uh, because that requires uh, that was based on uh, our solar system uh, arrangement. There was a there were a couple of papers that claimed that they would do it, uh, but that is more speculative rather than actual uh, evidence from the data. It is also based on limited amount of data. To claim that the, all exoplanets follow the TTS board law is not a, is an extremely strong claim, and you have to show that a significant fraction of them are following that. 
there are few systems which can which do that but that is statistically uh, random and not a law and tedious word law was actually uh, you know formulated you know before all our solar system planets were formed and i think it doesn't apply to one of the long period planets in our system like neptune or uranus Does that answer? You see? Okay. Yeah, mostly we are done okay. with the questions. Mega, you Mega have... is this the earlier ha raised hand or you have raised it again? No, ma'am, I want to ask one more okay, question here. So when we say like a specific plan, exoplanet is inhabitable, it is based off of the data that we get at a specific point. So does that also mean that it's going to remain inhabitable at a future point in time? Not necessarily. If we can live for billion years and then look at that planet again, it may be habitable. For example, Earth was, uh, we know now we have oxygen in the atmosphere, right? Two billion yes. years ago, Earth didn't have oxygen, but there was life. So can we make any kind of prediction that in the future, a specific exoplanet might be habitable? Uh, based on, so only on stellar evolution, how the planet, uh, the star brightens, but uh, we need to know more about how the planet is outgassing gases, what kind of a composition the planet has, how the, you know, we need to know a lot about predicting how the climate will change. We can predict on our, our own Earth's climate changing over the next uh, million to billion years. Okay, so thank you. Very hard. Yeah. Okay. So yes, we have done mostly. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Ravi, for a wonderful session, and that was very like great interactions, great questions by the participants, and very nice interactions with it. So thanks. So next week uh, we will be having four sessions starting from seventh. Uh, so. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. We'll be having sessions uh, next week. So the next lecture is by Dr. Jayesh Goyal on 7th. Sounds good. And he's going to talk about like a lot of questions that were there today about habitability, about uh, the exoplanets and all. And he's going to talk about the same. So yes, see you all on 7th. It's same time, 4.30. All right, see you. See you. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye. <laughs> Should I end meeting, Prati? Yes, sir. Okay, yeah. thanks. Thanks. Yeah.